So first off, let's start at the end and work backwards. Uh, you know, saw the official press release. You know, this uh, last couple of days, uh, retirement. Uh, what is what image does that bring? Because when I hear retirement, I think of seventy-five-year-old man leaving <laughs> the post office, not uh, beautiful woman uh, who still just got a whole life ahead of her. I think that's that's an interesting point. You know, like about the word retirement, and um, I know it's it's a, it's an unusual word to use in sport. Um, because it, it, it does feel like, you know, it, it's the, um, you know, you, you're meant to be old and, and um, you know, you, you're meant to wind down, whereas I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure life's just starting still. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, sport is, um, it's something I've known my whole life. I could not give you many memories without, you know, some form of sport um, being there and being competitive, you know, in, in any which way I went about it. And um, yeah, I, I think it's it's a new phase, you know. Um, there's the, I, I, I often remember conversations with people like Hamish Carter, and um, and he we were running along, and this would have been back in 2006. We were running in board. He's like, you know, I've been doing this for over 10 years now, and I was like, wow, that's a long time. That's a really long time to be doing it. And he's, you know, sort of thinking about where he was going next. And, and all of a sudden, it's like, really? I mean, I, I remember like yesterday starting this sport and, um, you know, professionally doing it for a yeah, good more than 10 years, I, I imagine now. Well, we, we just said, uh, you know, when we look back historically, you were in Toronto in July of 2001 for your very first World Cup race. The world, you're still a junior at the time because you raced in Edmonton later that uh, that fall at the Edmonton 2001 World Champs. You know what, what, was, what was going on in this young woman's mind, who's you know probably made one of her longest trips of her life from Australia to North America. You know any any thoughts at that time that this could be going on for you know 13 years and three world titles and Commonwealth it's, Games, Olympic Games, gold. It's incredible because I really did have this conversation with Jan yesterday and, and I don't remember the last time I, I talked about this race and um, it, it did come up by coincidence and, um, and he asked me as well what, what place I came and I remember 19th but he said it, the same thing, you know, what do you remember? And I said being cold, yeah, really cold. And I said it could only get easier from this <laughs> and um, obviously coming from Australia, um, you know, I, I, I've grown up in a very um, tropical climate. So for me, um, I, I definitely remember that water being absolutely freezing and not feeling my feet until I could see the finish line. Um, but one of the biggest things I remember is I was coached by D Bill Davern at the time, who, who later on became a high performance coach for, um, for Beijing. And he, um, he, he said to me, just follow Makili. Just whatever she does, you just follow. Just copy her. That's not a bad uh, thing to have to be following Olympic medalist and world champion. Exactly, and um, and funnily enough, yeah, Michele did go up to Bill afterwards and said, "What did you tell her?" And um, you know, I think for me, you know, I I had a lot of yeah, I had a lot of heroes that I'd come into the sport relatively late in a sense, but I mean, how could you not know who who our Australian women were in triathlon? We had a, an amazing history and. And for me, you know, I think that was just, I was just on this mission to, to follow to and copy yeah. whatever they did. And, um, and, you know, they had left a legacy before me. And, and I really felt like, you know, if, if I was going to race as an Australian woman in this sport, I better make sure I do it well. <laughs> I, I was looking at some data. Somebody sent me an email today. And I haven't been able to check it, con confirm it all. But they, they said that in 1998, and I have to believe them, Every single World Cup of that year was won by an Australian woman. And when mm -hmm. I've checked through, there was Arena Hill and Loretta Harrop and yeah. McKillie Jones. So, uh, you know, those names, as you say, all phenomenal athletes who went on to win major races and uh, were your role models. And obviously, you were able to keep that going. We're, we're up at, uh, you know, 2003. Um, we're now a couple of years into this career. And your first major wins start coming. I think it might have been in Japan when that first, yeah, yeah, when the first major World Cup win comes, uh, and then take me to New Zealand to the the World Championships, which really started to define you as a big one day get the job done when you needed to. Uh, take take me through to uh, Queenstown. Well, I think I think the beauty for me in Queenstown was um, I had never been on a senior team. I had nothing to expect and I had nothing to lose. Um, I'd been away training. I'd spent my, you know, my time, my my Australian summer, uh, winter, I should say, in, in the European summer training. So that was, uh, you, you know, a new and unique experience for me that I'd, um, you know, got to train all year round. And I was in a squad of the world number one was training, the world number two, 
and there was probably another five girls that on any given session, it was, it was on. And I really learnt a lot from them. Like I really learnt a lot about seeing what it took to be number one, what, it's, you know, what it involved, not just the training, but mentally what they went through every day and, and listened to them and, and just tried to thrive off them. So going into a world championship, I, I didn't expect anything. I, I, didn't, I just went out there to do what I could do. And I, I surprised myself, I, I truly did. I, I remember, and even when I um building this website, I, I found the footage. I've never watched any, any footage of me racing. And um, I remember looking and I remember feeling like, I don't even know what to do. Like um, when you cross the line, yeah. I, I, even coming towards the finish, I was like, oh, "Have I done it right? Did I did I do the right amount on the run?" Like I, you know, I just I had no idea. I had no idea what to expect, and and really all I'd done was you know knew what I'd been doing in training and went out and put it into race practice. And um, I think you know that was obviously the beginning for me where I saw that okay maybe this is going to be worthwhile. Peter Robertson's obviously tied with you in terms of both winning in 03 and then again in 05. Uh, ridiculously hot in Gamagori. Talk about you know your memories of that race. That was an unusual year because we didn't have the, um, age, the groupers. age groupers competing with us, so it felt um, it felt a little isolated. Um, I'd, I'd raced in Gamagori before and I knew how hot it was, um, but I I knew that. I had that up my sleeve. I knew that, you know, out of a lot of athletes competing there, if there was anybody that was, you know, accustomed to that type of weather and environment, I, I was definitely going to be in favour of, you know, um, getting through the race better than some of the Europeans that, you know, have just never experienced that sort of heat. So um, I, I've always loved racing in Japan. There's a really good feel um, for me there. And the same with Gamagori. I, I remember um, particularly being in the stands before the race and people were already, you know, really sweltering. And we had a really good, um, you know, sports science team and, and we were really into the pre-cooling before the race. And, you know, we were pretty much at the point, all the Australians, we were shivering. We had, you know, ice vests and cold towels and ice all over us and we were cold and then everybody's looking at us and, you know that's that's strange that's weird and I was like oh I just thought mm, we'll, see, we'll, we'll see in two hours whether you know whether or not that's strange or not and um, you know it really paid off and I think you know I, you continue to learn and I think I think for me um, I I think for me in that in that world title I think I needed to prove to myself that the first one wasn't a fluke um, I think I needed to know whether or not I just happened to have a good day or whether I got lucky on a big day and I, I think for me there was there was a different motivation for that race um, to do well. 206 might have been uh, although 208 was Olympic gold uh, maybe the most exciting year with Melbourne and winning a world title in, in the same year you know talk about your memories of 2006 because so few people ever get a chance to race in a multi-sport event at home yeah and, got goosebumps. <laughs> yeah and I, I can remember you know the the thickness of the crowd uh and you know that's really where you went from being a star to a rock star in my my mind of just you know everyone knew who you were by that point after the the, the not just the world championship title but winning in, in melbourne I think 2006, I mean, Malulba was always the kickoff. So, you know, the season was starting and, and obviously Commonwealth Games was very shortly after that. But not only Australia is, is so into their sport, but Melbourne as a city are just mad. And, and I honestly, in, in, the sense of, um, in the sense of the greater community, and I know that sounds unusual, but in the sense of racing for other people, and, and showing somehow a mutual support back for the people that support you, that was by far the most amazing race for me. Um, I just never expected the people to turn out and come and watch a triathlon like they did. I, I literally could not hear myself breathing on that run. It was that loud, it was that thick of people. I just thought this is incredible. Like I had never experienced anything like it and for me, um, it was the one time where I had probably the most of my family able to witness and, and actually my two, uh, my grandparents um, was it's the only triathlon that they've ever been able to watch. And um, I think they got quite a surprise afterwards as well. I mean, you're, yourself and Brad probably, are the only other two people who have that feeling would be the Brownleys who got to race in London. Yeah. At home, major games, family, grandparents, grade school teacher. Exactly. You know, and, and I, I remember how high Brad was coming off of that. And your status, I mean, you never change as a person to the outside, but, you know, your status in terms of other people's looking at you, sponsors, the media, 
went from like very good triathlete to absolute, you know, rock star. And, and in this era, and I guess a question I wanted to always ask you, um, you and Vanessa had this incredibly unique bond, as, as I could see it from an outside, that probably most people could never imagine both the camaraderie, the desire to beat each other, but the desire to push each other to new levels, and the pressure that I don't think anyone else could have appreciated that both you and she had going to Beijing. Both, both countries, if, if you guys did not come up with a medal, there would have been disappointment in Portugal, there would have been disappointment in Australia, and you both rose to the occasion to have one of the greatest women's races ever, and maybe the single best day ever for you, you know, at those games, watching a, a female triathlete. Uh, you know, your, your thoughts of your racing career with Vanessa and the back and forth between the two of you. Well, I think to go back a step, like you said, just about the sport in general in Australia, I remember the biggest change happening when, when people asked what you did, what sport you did, and I said triathlon, and and there was always this like awkward, like they sort of wanted to know what you meant and they're like, you're like marathon, you know, that's what they associated with. And I was like, well, yeah, it's about the two hour mark, but we, we swim and we bike first and, and then we finish off with a run. And um, so I think, you know, come, come Beijing and there was obviously a lot of talk about the rivalry between Vanessa and I. And funny enough, we talked about it once and we said, isn't it strange because I've never felt it. We actually raced. So, you know, no way we, we raced often, but not very often actually Together, against each world other. Championships, yeah. yeah, it was only at major races because obviously we lived on opposite ends of the world and, and, we, and we raced a lot. But um, I think the thing is, I always admired the way she raced and, and obviously the level that she competed at. And I felt the same that she felt the same about me. And so when we had the opportunity to race each other, it was, it was not a matter of, you know, I want to take you down. It wasn't this bitter rivalry. It was, like you said, it was a rivalry where it's like, you know, all right, this is, this is where it is. This is where we're at. And we were friends before and we giggled and laughed and stuff, what not before. But, of course, come race time, I mean, for sure. I mean, I wanted to win just as much as she did. This, this city sort of had a, a unique opportunity from my memory. And, and that was one of the sort of most unique world championships uh, and I can picture having doing the live commentary, Vanessa, about the length of this room ahead of you leaving out of the transition zone and you just inches away from catching. I mean, if you catch that lead group, you win the world title because you have the day's fastest run. You end up in the chase pack and with the day's fastest run comes second. Yeah. Uh, you, your memories of there, of Hamburg, of, of how life is about inches. Oh. And on that day, you were an inch short of making the lead pack. I, I mean, I, I think it's... Like you said, you always you, you, you have a rival and I think having a rival is the most amazing thing because they make you work on your weaknesses. And for me, I, I came from a swimming background, so that was more natural to me. Running just came through my cardiovascular fitness. I, I considered Vanessa a superb runner, so it forced me to work on my run. Um, but in the same breath, it forced Vanessa to work on her swim. And, you know, that, that really translated for her in 2007. You know, like you said, it was seconds and that that made or break the race for me and um you know that really again you know you're always learning you're always learning about every single race every every time then you know that you you think that um you may have something you you, you can't always look at your competition but you know they're also going to try and get one up on you as well and and all, all, I mean, all credit to Vanessa, like she, she had an absolutely amazing, amazing race. But for me, obviously I knew if I could ever get out of the swim ahead of her and she was in the second pack, well, it's like, okay, well, at least my chances are a little bit better than, than yep. another times. And, you know, to take away a world title in a, in, in a city like this, I have to say, I'm, I am a little bit jealous because if there's ever a place to do it. Hamburg is incredible. I mean, they are triathlon mad. The city comes out and, and they're cheering for everyone. Very few women have ever been able to get into that 32, 33 minute range on the run. You know, if we look historically, I sort of put four women, five women maximum into that uh, realm and you did it consistently and when it mattered. Uh, take us through, you know, Beijing, which might have been the most complete race because great women were there. They all wanted it, whether it was Laura Bennett or go down the list, you know, and, and you executed an absolutely massive, you know, display of athleticism on that day. I think from all the years and all my experience, I learned that I had to build up through the year. I knew that I wanted to be fitter than I'd ever been before, but I knew that that also took a lot of patience and it would take a big build up. And I really chose to, 
to do my season differently and um, and really choose it wisely. I, you know, I really made sure that um, I gave myself the opportunity to, to make stepping stones and I'd done it every year so I had noticed it. I'd noticed from where I'd been in Mooloolaba to where I'd been in the World Championship and I, and I looked at those things. And, you know, come Beijing, um, I actually never felt any pressure from anyone other than myself, you know. I, I really put as much pressure on myself as I think, you know, the rest of the country could have. And um, I, I really went about putting everything into the build up, into that year about doing as much right as possible. And, and that was making sure I stayed healthy, making sure I stayed uninjured. And what were all those things that it took to keep me that way? And if I could make a small incremental changes in those months before, if I could find just that 0.1%, then I'd be in a place that I've never been before. And if I'd been there, then I had nothing to lose. Again, like I went there in a way, probably the least nervous I've ever been in a race and which I find really unusual and I feel it feels quite strange to think about. But when you get to that level where you're like, you know what? There is absolutely nothing else I can do. And that was a really, really light feeling to race with. Right. I, I really remember going into that race. I remember being on the pontoon and looking at that first boy and going, wow, we're at the Olympics. Let's go, two hours. Let's just go have fun. And that was really, you know, that was a really, that was eye opening for me as well, you know, to see um, what mindset I could also go into a race with. And I, I, I liked big races, I, I, I really do, I, I love pressure, I really love the feeling of wanting to perform, of wanting to get the best out of myself, what can I do today? And, um, and I think, you know, uh, that's what I wanted to do at the biggest race of my life. If I follow forward, there were probably two more of those moments that maybe come, maybe there are more, but two that jump out to me. One was after some injuries and setbacks, having a ripper race in Budapest at the grand final, it was clear you couldn't win the world championships but you could say to everybody else, had this been a one day affair, uh, let me show you how good you know, Emma Snoso can be on that one day. Uh, take us to, to Budapest where again, there was all these women who had had a great season and on the day that they all wanted to have their best performance, you dominated again. I, I think it was, it was a similar circumstance where I probably thought that I wanted to raise my level for the whole year and, and, and I knew that that wasn't necessarily possible. And, um, you know, there was a lot of other factors that came into that, but definitely for the Budapest race alone, um, that the that our sport had become a series and that the World Championship was not considered, you know, or determined, I should say, off a one-day event anymore. But I treated it like that. I certainly treated that race because I did have, I wasn't in the running. I All I wanted to do was, you know what, it's a big race. I want to see what I can do again. And for me, you know, that's obviously, you know, when I look back at it and, and probably never realised it quite so much at the time as I do now, but I really did enjoy that. And, um, you know, of course, all the girls had been racing really well and, and the World Championship was um, was a decider for them. But for me, yeah, I was on the start line with, with no other thought of who else I had to beat or where my points were or where I needed to finish. I was just out there to do my thing and that was to uh, swim, bike, run as fast as I could. The last race that sort of sticks in my mind uh, for me with you was High V. Um, you know, again, for many people, it was one of the most important races because economically it was a game changer for many people, the biggest prize money. And when everybody wants to win, that's the day that everybody's you know going to be on their A game. And I even know over the years there were some people who backed off in the World Championships in 208 to be ready for High V a few weeks later, that kind of thing. So obviously it was another important race. You weren't showing big performances in health, but yet again on that day it comes through. You, any memories from from the high V race? Yeah, I mean, I, I really had been quite you know struggling in the few months before. Um, but again, like you said, I mean, it's not that you're motivated by money by any means. I, I never have felt that at all about sport. But I, there was obviously there is an allure to the race, and all the best wanted to be there. So in my mind, everybody was peaking and everybody wanted to be winning. Of course you know, the same as any other race, but some people, everybody started to start approaching it with more prestige. And, um, and it was, you know, it, it was an amazing thing. It is an amazing thing that that sort of prize money was offered in our sport. And it, it is sort of one of those once in a lifetime opportunities that, you know, you want to put your best foot forward. So I, I mean, definitely that race 
the, the first two thirds of it weren't going very well. Um, you know, I was, I was not having a great swim and I was certainly um, lagging behind on the bike, but I always, um, I think, you know, that's probably what, one of the first things I ever learned about triathlon is that, you know, it's not over till it's over and you've got to just keep pushing until you get to the finish. And for me, you know, getting off, I thought, well, same thing, you know, what have I got to lose? Just run and see what you've got left. And um, I never ever race with any, um, determined goal if I if that makes sense I never went for I'm going here to win I just went about every part of the process and and for me again it surprised me because all, all I did was you know what you're I'm not sure how many minutes behind at that point or you know quite a fair bit down from the leaders and all I thought was you know what there's only 10k left of this race to go you better make the most of it this uh, German uh, South African guy comes into your life uh, now you're married, life is changing. Uh, you know, Jan continues on with uh, the Ironman and the half Ironman. I've seen the great successes he's had this year, which I'm sure, you know, is uh, exciting for you guys looking at the next part of his career. Um, talk about how different things are. You're now setting up houses in Spain and, and you know, second houses all over. Uh, talk about that part of your life and what you're looking towards now that uh, swimming and biking every day isn't your number one priority. I think I think the biggest thing is we've both looked at things in our career that have worked and that haven't worked and and for both of us and and I feel like I've certainly um, yeah I guess living in Australia you've always had to make the choice of where you're going to be in Europe it's not a matter of whether you are it's you have to find a, a place to be and obviously him moving out of um, the Federation and and um, and not needing to be at the training center to live and and a change in environment is, is as good as anything and, and a refresh and um, and I'm, I'm really happy that he was open to do that because, you know, I think when you get in a place where you feel comfortable, um, you think that, you know, you have to stay there and you, you have to try and, you know, even though you're trying a different sport, so to speak, you know, you're trying a different part of it. I think, um, yeah, like anything, you, you need to, to give yourself a bit of like, you know, let's go find some new roads, let's go find some new trails. And you're still doing the same thing, but um, also having a different goal. And, and that's why, you know, we looked around and on some advice that we, we you know, checked out Girona through through a friend in Australia. And um, it, it's turning out to be a really, really um, good decision. It's, you know, Jan's loving the 70.3. And funny, funnily enough, when I first met him, I he always amazed me with how much training he could actually do. Um, and so I think, you know, the fact that he's, he's made the switch and his body's healthy as well and uninjured um, and he can see, you know, that there is so many aspects to our sport and I think we have to embrace that and be really grateful and thankful that we have those opportunities. Yeah. Um, so many people can be involved in, in, in the different distances and we all fall under the one banner of triathlon and to me that's really unique. And, um, I, you know, I think in my career that I was fortunate to go and race a lot of non-drafting races in America and particularly where I started in the sport in Australia was in that, in, in that similar culture. And, um, and you, it reminds you of your true love for it, I think, as well. And I think for him, you know, it's, um, he's, he's still extremely passionate about it. And I mean, Kona, it's, it's the holy grail. What can you say? I mean, you know, if you mention to people you do triathlon, well, the, typically the first thing they ask is, have you done Kona? And um, so I, I think for me, it's exciting to see where he where he's going, and and I love being a part of, you know, um, his process as well, and and for him to to see, you know, where he can still and what he can still get out of himself, and and I'm I'm pretty um, I'm pretty amazed to see where it's going so far. As you look back, uh, a few people, and obviously there's hundreds, but a few people who were instrumental at different moments for you that you know you want to say. Thank you for being there at the time I needed you for whatever reason. Oh yeah. my goodness, we could start another yeah. whole interview. I mean, look, obviously I started as a swimmer, my first swim coach, I mean, he taught me work ethic, he taught me what discipline is, he taught me about, you know, about the dynamics of training, the understanding of heart rate, the understanding of, of you know, of, of working. Um, I mean, he's, he's getting on now, Bill Richards, and, um, but he is still just, you know, he will be forever etched in my heart as, as somebody who, who taught me the fundamentals of, um, of training. And then, you know, when it comes to, to triathlon, um, you know, I, I started with, um, with Jenny Alcorn, who's quite um, infamous in Australia as well. But, um, you know, she later led me on to going to Bill Daverin when I, when I really wanted to, to see where I could possibly go. And funny enough, we ended up full circle in, in Beijing and had a, 
you know, an extremely um, successful relationship, I think, there. You know, he really gave me um, the opportunity to um, really let me do things how I thought were going to work for me. And at first, I think, you know, there was a bit of resistance, but I'm really, really grateful that he, he really opened um, his mind to me and allowed me to do it in that way. And, and I certainly wanted to, you know, show him that, you know, I'm say, look, I, I, I'm going to do it the way I think is best. And, and um, I hope I'm coming to you and saying that I did it the right way. Um, Brett Sutton, you know, without a doubt, um, he's, he's got a huge history in this sport. And, um, you know, there's, there's always going to be, um, you know, lovers and haters of many people and opinions and that. But my experience with, Bar with Brett um, as a, a trainer, a mental coach, um, are things that people don't know about until they're there and, and, um, and, and people have all different experiences but part of Brett was also the squad that he had and the things that I saw and just as many you know um, things that I used in training and racing of, of things he talked about and, um, and that became my key words you know in, in training and um, you know, who, who gave me my sticks that I run with and, 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 the, and the why behind those things. And for me, that was things in performance that I, I wouldn't, I, I honestly wouldn't have learned anywhere else. And um, I owe a great deal to him. And um, he really showed me the way of, um, of, of, of triathlon, of how to train for triathlon and what the work ethic was involved in training for triathlon. And, um, and, and I'm thankful that he, he brought me into his squad. He never had to either. And um, I owe a lot to him. And there are thousands of people yeah. who have difficult put question. their, yeah. you know, worked on me, put me together, you know, um, kept me going. And, um, and obviously, you know, there's people, you know, you come to races, there's supporters, there's fans, there's, um, there's sponsors and, you know, I could be here all day, but I really do. I really, really, at the bottom of my heart, if I could go and thank every single one of them, I'm thankful for the people I've met and, um, and the journey that they've helped me be on because, um, you know, they all make a part of it. Well, the resume is impeccable. No one will ever, you know, it'll be very difficult to see anyone surpass three world titles, Commonwealth Games, Olympic gold, and all the, the dozens of victories around the world. Uh, and please remember that you are still part of this family. So even though you may at some point be making your own family uh, and with a gold medal, mom and dad, uh, <laughs> we would love to get to 5% of the shares for the future. <laughs> small racehorse, but uh, <laughs> we wish you best of luck. And I know that whatever you decide to do next, it'll be a, a successful venture. Thank you. No, awesome. I'm looking forward to it.